join us for this webinar about thyroid nodules and goiters. And especially pleased that our speaker today is Professor Mark Strachan, who's a consultant endocrinologist in the metabolic unit at the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. Mark has been one of the BTF's medical advisors for many years, and he's one of our most valued trustees as well. Mark has a, a very busy clinical practice dealing with patients with all kinds of endocrine conditions, and he has a particular interest in endocrine on oncology. So we're extremely grateful that Mark has found time uh, in his very busy schedule uh, to speak to us all today. Here at the BTF, we in increasingly receiving more and more questions from people who have concerns about their thyroid nodules. And the questions are typically uh, that people are really desperate for clear information about how these conditions should be investigated, what treatments are available, uh, and what kind of follow-up treatments they should expect. And I'm sure that many of you who've joined us today have also got questions. So please type in any questions you have into the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, either during Mark's presentation or during the Q&A session after that. And we'll get through as many of the questions as we can, hopefully all of them. But if we do run out of time, or if you think that there's something, uh, think, think of something after the event, then please do feel free to email us and then we'll do our best to get you an answer then. So finally, just the usual reminder that Mark can only give out general information and won't be able to advise you in the respect of any specific med medical queries. So if you've got any questions about your own situation, then uh, you should always consult your own doctor. So I think that covers it. Um, and over to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Julia. And hello, everybody. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see my slides. Can you see them OK, Julia? Yes, perfect. Thank you. OK. So, yeah, as, uh, as Julia uh, said, I'm going to uh, speak to you uh, this evening about thyroid lumps and uh, goiters. So the first thing to say is that lumps in the thyroid, nodules in the thyroid, are extraordinarily common. If you take now these figures I've got here in this uh, on this pyramid are are not that they're. They're sort of broad guesstimates rather than, uh, than absolutes. But if, if you take the UK population as being approximately 60 million um, uh, at the moment, it's a bit more than that. If you look by ultrasound uh, at people, particularly over the age of 40, a very, very high proportion of people have thyroid nodules that you can see an ultrasound scan probably 30, 40% of people over the age of 40 have a thyroid nodule. It's almost, I, I'm almost increasingly coming to believe that, that, that nodularity in the, in the thyroid gland is a normal part of healthy aging, healthy getting older. So if you take that figure, that means approximately 25 million people in the UK today have a nodule in your thyroid that could be picked up on, a, on an ultrasound scan. Now, most of these nodules are very small. You can't actually see them or you can't actually feel them if you, if you touch your neck. Palpable thyroid nodules are about 10% of all um, thyroid nodules. So that's about two and a half million people in Britain have a, a palpable thyroid nodule. Only about one in 10 palpable thyroid nodules turns out to be a, a thyroid cancer. So that means it's about 250,000 people um, in the UK with, uh, with thyroid cancer. But actually, the number of cases that we see presenting every year of thyroid cancer is much, much lower than that, about 5,000 cases in the UK per year. So what that means is that many people with a thyroid cancer are living with that cancer and don't actually know that they have it. And it may actually never cause them any problems 
throughout their, throughout their life. The treatment for thyroid cancer is in the main, certainly for the commonest forms of thyroid cancer, is extremely good. And actually, in relative terms, very few people die as a consequence of thyroid cancer. Between 50 and 100 people per year across the United Kingdom. So the, the purpose of this opening slide is just to emphasize that, that nodules in the, th in the thyroid are very, very common. Only a minority of them turn out to be a cancer. And even if they do turn out to be a cancer, most people will be cured of that cancer. Now, a swelling or a lump in the thyroid is actually only one of many different uh, lumps that you can get in your neck. A lump in the neck is the commonest means by which um, uh, a thyroid nodule has typically presented, and I use typically um, advisedly. But actually, a, a swelling in, in the neck can be caused by many other things other than a, a lump in the thyroid. One of the rarer uh, forms, but is one that is beloved of uh, medical textbooks, is something that's called a thyroglossal duct cyst. So when, when you're um, an embryo or a fetus in our mother's uh, tummy, your thyroid actually starts off life at the back of the tongue. And it actually migrates down into the midline of the, the neck as, uh, as the baby grows in a mum's tummy. But it retains a little sort of tether, almost like a, an umbilical cord attached to the, to the back of the, of the tongue. Now, in most people at the time of birth, that tether has um, shriveled away to really not very much at all. But in some people, that tether remains, and it's called the thyroglossal duct. And occasionally, you can get a cystic swelling. A cyst really just means a fluid-filled lump that uh, develops in the, uh, in the neck, usually at a level just above the thyroid. And the classic thing that is in textbooks is said to distinguish a thyroglossal duct cyst from, uh, from a thyroid swelling is that it a thyroglossal duct cyst moves when you stick your tongue out. Thyroid swellings tend to move when you swallow, but only thyroglossal duct cysts move when you stick your tongue out. So that's uh, uh, one of these neat medical things. Of course, these days, everybody will get a scan and the di real diagnosis is made on the, on the ultrasound scan rather than on examination. More common cysts, uh, more common lumps than that, though, are um, due to lymph glands. So in our neck, we have thousands of lymph glands on each side of the neck and in the middle of the neck. And lymph nodes um, can be palpable. You can feel them, particularly in uh, younger adults and, and children, and that's entirely normal. Lymph nodes also enlarge normally if you have an infection, um, often if you have, for example, if you have tonsillitis, you'll get a sore neck. And, and actually, if you feel your neck, it's because there's an enlarged lymph gland there. And that's because the tonsils drain out into the lymph nodes in the neck. So lymph node enlargement is not automatically a bad thing. It can just be a normal just be entirely normal, or it can be secondary to uh, a short-lived infection. Sometimes more serious um, abnormalities, um, such as cancers, can present with lymph node enlargement. And then there are a variety of other um, reasons why you may get a swelling in the neck. You get other cysts called branchial cysts, which again are what we call developmental cysts. These have been present since um, um, embryonic or fetal uh, life. A lipoma is a benign lump of the fatty tissue that sits under the skin. Just under the angle of the, of the jaw, um, 
uh, on each side it sits a salivary gland and that can become enlarged classically if you've got something like mumps or if you get a little stone in the salivary gland you get a painful enlargement there but that can present with a with a lump in the uh, in the neck and of course if you have um uh, some abnormality in the skin. You get funny uh, things called sebaceous cysts or other things that can present with um, swellings in the neck. So all swellings in the neck are not thyroid in origin. There's a very large differential diagnosis of neck swellings. But the, the classic feature of a thy thyroid swelling is that it arises in the, the, in the midline of the, of the neck, in the lower part of the neck, above the, the breastbone, and that it classically moves when you swallow. So your doctor might ask you to um, take a sip of water and see if the swelling moves. Now, if there are a large number of causes of lumps in the neck, there's almost an even larger number of causes of lumps or swellings in the thyroid itself. So a thyroid swelling has a very large differential diagnosis. A generalized enlargement of the thyroid is called a goiter. So when we talk about goiter, that's essentially what we mean is that it is a uh, a generalized enlargement of the, of the thyroid. And we, we typically divide that into two forms, diffuse and multinodular. Diffuse means that it is usually a symmetrical, smooth enlargement of the, of the thyroid, whereas multinodular, as the name implies, is that it's lots of nodules, lots of lumps. And so, as you can see on the picture there, it's uh, it, this is obviously a very dramatic uh, uh, goiter in the, in the bottom part of the of the picture. It's asymmetric. It's it's lumpy. It's lobulated, and that's a classic multinodular goiter uh, picture. Now, again, these descriptions, diffuse and multinodular, are based tr on traditional examination, hand examination. It's what you feel when uh, as a doctor or, or a healthcare professional, you're feeling it in at the, at the neck. Of course, in reality, again, when you do scans, you realize that um, diffuse goiters often have a degree of nodularity and irregularity and asymmetry to them. So, the, the scan reveals a lot more than a simple examination with the, with the hands. But if you take the classic diffuse, symmetrical, smooth goiters, then um, the, there is, a, 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 again, a long list of causes of that. Now, a simple goiter means that your thyroid blood tests are normal, and there is no obvious underlying abnormality or health problem. You could say it's almost a normal variant. What you effectively just have a bigger thyroid than, uh, than most people have. What we increasingly recognize though is that um, a proportion of people with a simple goiter, which is just this smooth symmetrical enlargement, will go on in later life and develop a multinodular goiter. So a simple goiter is a sort of prequel to a multinodular goiter. Graves disease, an, um, the, the classic autoimmune cause of overactive thyroid, often associated with, or sometimes associated with uh, thyroid eye disease as shown in, this, in the top picture, is another cause of a, of a, of a, a simple uh, or, or a smooth diffuse goiter. And conversely, Hashimoto's disease or autoimmune hypothyroidism also can cause a, a, a goiter. Yeah. The UK is a, a country that is associated what, with what we call iodine insufficiency. We probably, some of us don't get just quite as much iodine in our diet as we should. 
But there are some parts of the world, particularly landlocked countries, particularly traditionally countries with um, uh, mountainous areas where uh, we're very remote from um, from uh, from uh, major population centres, iodine deficiency is very very common, and that is worldwide a very major cause of uh, uh, thyroid swelling. Sometimes called endemic goiter because it's, it was traditionally so common. The World Health Organization is, has. Um, devoted a lot of time and uh, energy in uh, iodine supplementation in parts of the world where there is serious and significant iodine deficiency in an attempt to reduce the, um, the uh, prevalence of iodine deficiency. Some medications that are prescribed can also cause uh, goiters, and there are also some um, uh, genetic disorders, sometimes grouped together as congenital hypothyroidism, that can present with, uh, with a goiter. Multinodular goiter, as I say, is often uh, 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 the consequence or the aftermath of, of someone who's had a simple goiter for many years, and is something that we don't really know what causes it. It, it a you know, very common question with people present with lumps in the thyroid is, well, why, why have I developed this? And I have to say, my commonest answer is, I don't know. Sometimes I can say, yep, you've got evidence of autoimmunity. Um, um, you have iodine deficiency. You have a, a congenital problem that's causing it. But that is a minority. Most people with, with lumps in their thyroid we actually genuinely do not know why they happen. All we, I, as I said at the beginning is that they are much more common as we get older, and it maybe is just something that happens as we get older, part of the, the aging process of the, of the thyroid. So a goiter describes a generalized enlargement of the thyroid. And so then classically, we would uh, have another category, which were solitary thyroid nodules. So that was where somebody presented with an isolated lump that was in the thyroid. So you can see in this picture here that there is a swelling in, the, in um, this person's right side of the neck. It starts in the midline and is extending a bit over on the right side, but the, it's, it's, it's asymmetric. There's not an enlargement of the left side of the neck. So again, on examination, you would have said, okay, this is a solitary thyroid nodule. Again, though, very often when you do a scan of the neck, you see that actually it's not a solitary nodule. This person has actually got lots of nodules in their thyroid. It's just that most of them are too small to feel. In younger people, you do see uh, 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 on occasion true solitary thyroid nodules. But actually, in, in most people, a, a solitary thyroid nodule is just one nodule that is palpable on a background of a, of a more lumpy, bumpy thyroid. The overwhelming majority of, um, of thyroid lumps, as I said at the beginning, are benign. And they are usually one of the top three categories. So some of the nodules are simple fluid-filled bags, cysts. Probably most commonly of all, you get what are called hyperplastic nodules. And that is just essentially a generalized overgrowth of part of the thyroid. Sometimes if, if that hyperplastic nodule almost outgrows its blood supply, part of it might actually die off and the cells in part of it die off and create a little hole in the nodule that then fills with fluid and we say then that is a mixed solid and cystic 
nodule. That would be quite a common thing that uh, uh, we will describe to people. We will say, okay, there is a three centimeter lump in the right side of your thyroid and it's mixed solid component cellular element and a mixed cystic element. Whether it's a purely solid nodule or a mixed cystic or, um, and solid nodule doesn't make any difference one way or another in terms of uh, how worried we might be about that or the likelihood that it will be um, something more than a benign lump. Less commonly, you can get what's called a follicular adenoma. Now, this is where I'm going to get just slightly technical. And, and if, if you don't follow what I'm saying, it, it genuinely doesn't uh, matter. But an adenoma is another form of benign lump. The difference between an adenoma and a hyperplastic nodule is made on um, the number of cells that the nodule has arisen from. In an adenoma, there has been one cell that has become abnormal, and it is then multiplied, and, mul and those cell cells, daughter cells have in turn multiplied, and those granddaughter cells have in turn multiplied, so that you end up with a nodule that is derived ultimately from one abnormal cell. It's what's called a clonal abnormality. Now, cancers also derive from the same process. It's one cell that's gone rogue that then has multiplied and um, uh, has, has created a lump. But adenomas, even though they are clonal, derived from one cell, are still benign lumps. Hyperplastic nodules, by contrast, it's lots of different cells have overgrown and multiplied to create the hyperplastic nodule. It is a pathological distinction in practical terms, whether you've got a follicular adenoma or a hyperplastic nodule doesn't make any difference. They're benign lumps one way or another. The only difference, um, uh, but, well, it, it, in theory, uh, the, the, some people uh, believe in other parts of the body that an adenoma can progress to a carcinoma. That probably happens in um, the large bowel, for example. Bowel cancer usually has started off life as a benign lesion that has then converted to a cancer. But we have no evidence in the thyroid that that is the, that that is the case. Cancers start as cancers in the thyroid. They don't go from benign lumps to cancer lumps. And that's something, again, that people ask me very commonly. You know, I, I'll say to them, you know, we, this, you have a, a benign lump in your thyroid. And people say to me, could that become a cancer in, yeah. as I get older? And the answer to that is, no, it can't. Benign lumps in the thyroid stay as benign lumps. Very occasionally, something that is thought to be a benign lump might years down the line declare itself to actually be a, to actually be a cancer. But that lesion was always a cancer. It's just that we got the, the, the diagnosis was, was not correct initially. It was called a benign lump when actually it was a cancer and it's been a cancer all the way along. So I... I, I it's a, it's a, again, it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to explain, but basically benign lumps do not change and become cancers in the, in the thyroid. Something that's called a benign lump may at a later stage be called a cancer, but that lesion was always a cancer. It's not changed to a cancer. I've listed all the different types of cancer that you can get in the, in the thyroid, not to worry you, but I'm just listing them there for completeness. Papillary and follicular cancer are by far and away the commonest forms of cancer in the thyroid. But I would emphasize again that most lumps in the thyroid are benign lumps. It's only a minority that turn out to be a cancer. Now, how do... Um, 
thyroid lumps present? Well, um, the commonest way typically was presenting with a, a lump in the neck, either that the person noticed themselves or um, was, were noticed by someone else. So men might notice a lump when they're shaving. Women might notice a lump um, when they're putting on a, on a necklace or something. You know, it, it's uh, very varied. But you'll um, have hooked in that obviously that's only uh, a subset of lumps that will, thyroid uh, lumps that will present with something that is obvious. Most lumps, as I said at the very beginning, are not palpable, they're not visible. You only see them on a scan. And actually now probably the commonest presentation of a neck lump that we see, uh, of a thyroid lump that we see is actually something that's been uh, picked up because you've had a scan of your neck for another reason. So for example, somebody who's had a mini stroke or um, might have an ultrasound scan done of their neck, not so much in the UK, but particularly in um, uh, uh, overseas countries, people as part of a, of a health check get offered a, an ultrasound scan of their neck and a nodule might be seen on that. You might have a CT scan done um, because you've had a chest infection or because of you've been diagnosed with a cancer in another part of your body. You may get a scan done of your spine because of back pain. And for reasons, for a myriad of reasons, um, uh, the nodule uh, is in the thyroid is identified. I said that the overwhelming majority of thyroid nodules are benign. The only exception to that are thyroid nodules that are picked up on PET scan. So a PET scan is a scan that's often done um, in where people are being, who have been confirmed to have a cancer in another part of the body um, are having a PET scan done as, what, as part of what we call the staging of the cancer. And if, if a nodule is picked up on a PET scan, then about one in five of those turns out to be uh, a cancer. Um, but obviously four and five are not cancers. So just because a, a nodule in the thyroid is picked up in a PET scan does not mean that it will turn out to be a, a thyroid cancer. Much less commonly, um, thyroid nodules can present with physical signs or, or symptoms. Um, this picture here that I'm showing is of a, of a thyroid nodule on a CT scan. The, uh, the two red arrows are pointing to the thyroid lump and the white arrow is pointing to the windpipe. Now your windpipe should be right in the midline of the scan. The two white areas above and below the, the lump, I don't know if you can see my black arrow here, uh, the top here is the breastbone and the bottom here is the um, spinal column, the vertebral column. And the, the windpipe should be right in the middle, um, uh, uh, centered on those two bones. But you can see here that the, um, uh, the, the windpipe is being shunted over to the, to the side. The, the, the nodule is moving the, the windpipe over to the side. And that sometimes can cause narrowing of the, of the windpipe and can cause a, a funny whistling noise when you breathe in. So I'm going to try and demonstrate it. It's a sort of <gasps> noise like that. And we call that stridor. That's different from wheeze, which is a noise that you make when you breathe out that you might hear in somebody with asthma or bronchitis. Stridor is very rare. And it is usually a sign that the, the windpipe is being narrowed. Less commonly, um, it can, a goiter, uh, uh, can cause difficulty with swallowing. And very occasionally, it can cause hoarseness of the, of the voice if it's um, uh, causing pressure on one of the nerves that supplies the voice box. But I, I would say it's a tiny minority of thy thyroid lumps that present with those symptoms. The sign that I'm showing here 
is an even rarer sign. It's, um, it's called Pemberton's sign. And it's caused by the, um, a, a goiter blocking the, the main vein as it comes out of the, uh, of the head. And so when you raise your hand, hands, arms in the air, the goiter sinks down and squashes the, uh, the vein. And so the blood can't drain properly from your, from your head and you go bright red. I've never seen that sign myself in the 30 years that I've been doing endocrinology. Now I said that some thyroid nodules um, can produce excess thyroid hormone, thyrotoxicosis. Hyperplastic nodules and adenomas can, uh, can do this. Uh, oh, if the, by far and away, the commonest cause of thyrotoxicosis is Graves' disease, but 75% of all cases of, grave, uh, of thyrotoxicosis are due to Graves' disease. But about 15% of cases are due to a multinodular goiter, and about 5% are due to solitary nodules. So what the, the pictures that I'm showing here are of thyroid uptake scans. So the top one is a multinodular goiter. So you can see that there are what we call hot spots, multiple hot spots, um, and that's because this person has got multiple nodules of differing sizes. You can see there's one really big one at the bottom, and, and two smaller ones higher up um, that are producing extra thyroid hormone. Whereas in the scan at the bottom, you have one hot spot, one big round hot spot, and then you can just make out the ghost image of the of the thyroid particularly on the left-hand side and on the right, on the same size as the nodule, just um, uh, popping up above the, of the top of the nodule. So these, um, so most thyroid nodules do not make extra thyroid hormone, but some do. And we say we call those toxic thyroid nodules. Toxic thyroid nodules are virtually never cancers virtually never, to the point that we would not usually investigate, we, we wouldn't do a biopsy on a toxic nodule, because the chances of it being a cancer are extraordinarily uh, small. Toxic nodules respond very well to surgical treatment or radioactive iodine. Long-term antithyroid medication is a no, another uh, option. But most thyroid nodules don't make any thyroid um, uh, hormone at all, or make much less than normal thyroid. And so they actually appear what we call cold nodules on a syntogram. I'll show you a picture of one of these in a, in a second. But you, these nodules are called hot nodules because they're, they're taking up the tracer so avidly. Uh, but most thyroid nodules, which make little or no thyroid hormone, appear cold on a, on a syntogram. So if somebody presents with a thyroid lump, the first investigation, the investigation of choice uh, initially is to check their thyroid hormone levels, because if they have evidence of overactivity, then you go down a completely different path. You go down a path of um, management on, uh, of uh, an overactive thyroid. And I'm not actually gonna say any more about that at this particular point. If your thyroid hormone levels are normal, they're not, uh, they're not elevated, or indeed you don't have uh, evidence of hypothyroidism, then traditionally, back in the 1990s, you would have had a thyroid syntogram. And here you can see this cold nodule in the, um, uh, in the, the left lobe of the, of the thyroid. You can see, uh, a ghost image of a, of a nodule with normal uptake in the, the, re, the remaining thyroid. And traditionally, that would have been the first line investigation for somebody presenting with a, with a thyroid lump who had normal thyroid function tests. And if the nodule appeared cold, then you would have a fine uh, needle aspiration, an FNA, a biopsy of the nodule. In the 2000s, we started, uh, we, we realized that thyroid scintigraphy wasn't 
very useful in the investigation of, um, of thyroid nodules when thyroid hormone levels were normal. And we moved to just doing a biopsy straight off. You might get an ultrasound, but we didn't do a lot of ultrasounds um, initially. And if you did do an ultrasound scan, then it was really just to measure the size of the nodule um, and to see if there were any uh, lymph glands there. But it wasn't, ultrasound wasn't that useful um, a measure. However, that has all changed now. Thyroid ultrasound scan, uh, thyroid ultrasonography in expert hands, and I emphasize in expert hands, is now a very, very reliable test that we use to help us distinguish benign nodules from cancer nodules in the thyroid. And it really now has become the first line investigation of thyroid nodules after you've done thyroid function tests and after you know that those tests are, are normal. And in fact, many centers now offer uh, one-stop um, uh, assessments where you come up uh, with a, a lump in your thyroid um, and you get an ultrasound scan done and you see the, uh, a doctor to discuss or a healthcare professional to discuss the results at the, at the same uh, visit. And it, you, I'm just showing you this, uh, not to go through it in any detail, you'd be pleased to hear, but now we get a, a grading of thyroid oh. nodules, which in essence uh, gives uh, a measure of the, uh, the likelihood that the, uh, the thyroid the, uh, radiologist has on how, how certain they are that that nodule is benign versus uh, a cancer. So if the nodule is very, uh, is, has got hallmark features of a, uh, a benign nodule, then um, um, it will be given what's called a U2 grading. Whereas if it looks like a, um, uh, has features that are absolutely textbook for a, for a cancer, then it will be given a U5 grading. And if there's uncertainty and depending on the degree of uncertainty, it will be given a U3 or a U4 grading. Ultrasound has had a very marked um, impact on uh, thyroid nodule services up and down the country. Certainly in Edinburgh, when we introduced that U1 uh, to U5 grading system, it reduced the number of thyroid biopsies uh, that were done by about 80%. In other centers, biopsy rates haven't fallen by quite so much. And that's because the utility of thyroid ultrasound it depends very much on the degree of expertise of the um, ultrasound operator. Ultrasound is a, is a very subjective um, um, investigation. It, it requires user expertise. And, it, and the reality is it depends on what part of the country you live in and what the nature of your service, local services, on the degree of expertise of the thyroid ultrasonographer. And that's no criticism on some part, but the, you know, the reality is that if you live, for example, in a, in a, in a, a remote and rural part of the, of the country, you can't have um, experts in, um, thyroid ultrasonography um, in centers where there are very few people coming through with thyroid lumps. It's fine um, in large centers like Edinburgh or Glasgow or Birmingham or London, you have thousands of people requiring uh, thyroid ultrasound scans every year. And so there is a critical mass that allows uh, departments, x-ray departments, radiology departments, uh, to build up expertise uh, in that. If you're in a very small center in a, um, a remote part of the country where maybe only five or six people uh, a year need an ultrasound scan, you'll appreciate that you can't 
have a, an, an expert in thyroid ultrasonography doing your scan. And, and what that means is that if it's somebody who's less comfortable doing thyroid ultrasound scans, they're more likely to give what's called an indeterminate grading on the thyroid ultrasound scan. They're less willing to, to, if you pardon the pun, stick their neck out and say, yeah, this lump is benign or this lump is a cancer. They'll say, mm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'll call it U3, which is indeterminate. That is just the nature of healthcare. And obviously with um, moves to greater electronic re uh, reporting and um, telemedicine, hopefully we'll be able to reduce this variation in practice in the, in the future. But it is just the nature of, of healthcare. If uh, the only other option would be to bring people from hundreds of miles away into big centers to get scans done. And that of course is not universally popular. People don't want to travel um, large distances to get scans. The other thing to say is that um, of course, this has increased demand for thyroid ultrasound scan very substantially. Um, and particularly in countries with private healthcare systems, you know, the, and, I, and I, again, I'm, I'm not making a judgment on that. It's just a statement of fact that um, where, um, where healthcare professionals are paid a fee for doing an investigation, you're more likely to end up getting investigations done. Most thyroid nodules in expert hands are given a U2 or benign grading. Now, the reality is that most people with a, uh, with a U2 nodule don't require any follow-up of that nodule. It's been declared as being a benign nodule. And um, in theory, uh, follow-up is, is not required. But again, that depends on the degree of expertise of the person that has done that scan and the, the confidence that they have and the confidence that the clinicians have in the, uh, in the ultrasound operator. And, um, but then you get into, you can, and again, this is probably going to be getting a bit too technical. You get into the, the problem of, of how you then, if you are following up people with benign nodules, what you do. The, the, the standard thing has been to do a further ultrasound scan after a, six months or after a year or after two years. And, you're, and really what you're looking for is evidence of, of the nodule growing. But the reality is that growth of a nodule is not in itself a reliable discriminator as to whether that nodule is benign or not benign. Because of course, if you have a benign nodule that's three centimeters, well, that benign nodule had to be a two centimeter nodule, had to be a one centimeter nodule at some point in the past. So growth of a nodule is not necessarily a bad sign. And similarly, thyroid cancers can grow very, very slowly. And so lack of growth of a nodule is not necessarily a good sign. And so that's why often, and it may seem uh, almost uh, a crazy thing for me to say that the best thing to do with U2 nodules is not to follow them up at, at all, because sometimes doing follow up scans creates in itself anxiety uh, on the part of the um, individual um, and, and can sometimes even offer a false reassurance. This is a very gory picture, I'm afraid, of uh, somebody getting a thyroid biopsy. Um, I'm not really going to say a lot about thyroid biopsies. Um, really, we only need to biopsy now nodules that are graded indeterminate or above. Um, I've put here a, a thyroid biopsy is well tolerated. Um, that's easy for me to see because I've never had a thyroid biopsy. Um, and I'm sure if you have had one, you'll tell me that actually it, was a, uh, it wasn't the most pleasant experience of all. And I, and I could absolutely uh, get that. We used to do um, thyroid biopsies, what we call freehand. You would just palpate the nodule and stick a needle in it. Now most um, uh, thyroid biopsies are done under ultrasound guidance. 
Third biopsy is not easy. And um, it's again, a bit like ultrasound, it's very operator um, dependent. And so ideally you want somebody doing a thyroid biopsy that's doing lots of thyroid biopsies um, so that um, they get good at it and they've got a very high, um, uh, what we call technical adequacy rate. I'm not really going to say very much about thyroid cancer, um, but thyroid cancer has got more common over the last 40 years, threefold more common, but that may not be a true um, uh, figure in the sense that um, we do a lot more scans. So a lot more thyroid cancers are picked up as early cancers that, as I said right at the beginning, may never have declared themselves um, in years gone by. The two commonest forms of thyroid cancer are papillary and, and follicular. Papillary is the commonest of all. It's commonest in, in younger people um, and can spread to, to local lymph nodes. The lump here is a, a, um, a lymph node that's enlarged because of papillary um, cancer. We aim to cure virtually everybody with papillary thyroid cancer. Follicular cancer, is the second commonest form and is more common in people um, from middle age uh, onwards. You less commonly get um, lymph node involvement, but rarely it can spread to liver and bone. But most follicular cancers don't spread. And that is an important thing to, to emphasize. And again, we aim to cure virtually everybody with follicular thyroid cancer. Survival is slightly less good though than for um, papillary, but only slightly. The reason we have got very high cure rates is because the treatment is very good. So most people with uh, papillary and follicular uh, cancer will have a thyroid operation of one form or another, and a proportion will get radioactive iodine and then high dose levothyroxine with the aim of suppressing TSH. So this is my final slide, Julia. Um, thyroid nodules are really common. And as I say, probably almost a normal part of aging. Most nodules are non-functioning, but some cause thyroid toxicosis. The overwhelming majority of thyroid nodules are benign. Thyroid cancer is rare, uh, but the treatment for thyroid cancer, particularly for the commonest forms, is very good. So I'll stop sharing my screen, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Can I just say, Julia, I was conscious uh, during that talk that my son next door, who was playing on his computer games, heard him. very loudly. <laughs> yes, I thought you could hear him. But it wasn't very loud. Yeah, well, yeah. So that's, so it's just to say that he wasn't in any pain. Uh, there wasn't any um, uh, any abuse going on other than uh, him uh, playing on a on a very violent computer game. A so. normal game, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm hope it's going well. Thank you. It wasn't too noisy at all. It was just entertaining background. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive talk. I've never had so much information just about nodules, and it's really uh, it's a treat to hear to have the opportunity to hear so much about it. So we really appreciate such clear clear information. So we've got quite a lot of questions, so I'll start putting them to you if that's okay. So um, somebody says, uh, to, to start us off, an overall one, I've had an overactive thyroid issue on and off since my first child seven years ago. Just wondered, will it be something I always have? So um, if you've had an overactive thyroid on and off for a long time, that's most likely means that... Um, uh, you have Graves' disease. Um, I say that for two reasons. One, because Graves is the commonest cause of an overactive thyroid. And two, because Graves' disease often um, uh, waxes and wanes and, and comes and goes. So um, some Graves' disease can burn itself out with time, but for many people, it is a recurring uh, problem. And that's why we often recommend definitive treatments such as surgery or radioactive iodine, if that is the uh, case. If you have an overactive thyroid because of a lump in your thyroid, so um, a multinodular goiter or a, a, a resultatory toxic nodule, then that generally won't go away um, 
it, you, you can normalize your thyroid hormone levels with tablets. But if you stop the tablets, the overactivity will come back because the tablets don't modify the underlying natural process. And so that's why, again, definitive treatment with surgery or radioactive iodine is usually advocated. Okay, thank you. So it wasn't strictly nodules, but it was a question we often get. Yeah, yeah. And, and on a similar vein, but more about the nodules, we've got a couple of similar questions. Um, I've got a th multi nodule multinodular go goiter and Graves' disease. Is it usual for the goiter itself to increase and decrease in size? And then uh, another question was somebody who um, talked about a nodule being diagnosed as malignant, but that seems to be coming and going too. Is that possible that it could be shrinking? Yeah, so, um, so Graves' disease, absolutely, definitely, goiters do increase and decrease in size because actually in Graves' disease, some of the goiter is due to the fact that your thyroid cells are bigger, they're making more thyroid hormone and uh, you have more of them because of the antibody production. But actually a large part of the goiter and Graves' disease is because uh, you're pumping so much blood around your body that the, the thyroid gland becomes engorged with blood. Um, and so it does wax and wane in size. People often say to me, um, with thyroid lumps, and so this is not Graves' disease, this is they have a lump in their thyroid, be it a benign lump or a cancer, that they sometimes notice that the lump is bigger and sometimes smaller. And that is a very common thing that people tell me. I have to say, it is hard for me always to understand how that might be the case, because really with, with a lump in your thyroid, a hyperplastic nodule or a cancer, it should not really get smaller. There's no real mechanism where that may be the case. Thyroid cancers usually get bigger with time, but only very, very slowly because most thyroid cancers grow very, very slowly. Um, but what that questioner or those questioners have said is a very common symptom. And I, I, I'm not disputing it, it's just that I, it, it's not something that I can readily explain. That's useful to know that. Um, this question asks, uh, says that the uh, patient has been referred to both ENT and endocrinology with respect to a benign goiter, um, which may need surgery. I'm wondering if which of the two disciplines would be better than the other for them to, to follow the surgery? Well, uh, obviously, I'm an endocrinologist, so there's, there's no question at all it's uh, endocrinology. No, in, in all seriousness, I think it, it depends different parts of the country um, have got different what we call pathways for how nodules and goiter are investigated and managed. Usually endocrinologists will see people where a goiter is associated with abnormal thyroid hormone levels because there, there's usually an underlying medical cause that needs medical uh, treatment, certainly initially. Usually you're referred to see a surgeon if thyroid hormone levels are normal and where really the, the, the main treatment option that's on the table is surgery or otherwise just observation. So um, uh, I, I don't, it's unusual to be referred to two different clinics simultaneously. And I don't quite understand why that would happen because normally it would just be, uh, just be one. But I think if I can understand why you might not want to have to go to two different appointments. So it might be worth just clarifying with your GP, what, what's the rationale for being referred to, to two different uh, services? Because that does seem unnecessary. Thank you. Um, somebody's asking about RFA, RFA, radio frequency ablation, and how widely is it used? And when might it be used uh, to treat a thyroid nodule? Yeah, so radio frequency ablation is basically putting a, a probe in um, into the into the nodule, and you pass a high uh, energy pulse into the nodule, and in theory, it could cause the nodule to shrink down. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna be careful in what I what I say here. So, RFA is used why is used not widely, it is, is available in many parts of the world, usually high income, high resource settings. Um, 
it would be fair to say that there are large numbers of advocates of RFA, but there's not a lot of published evidence about it. Now, actually, currently, NICE is doing um, an, uh, a, what's called a technology appraisal on RFA to look to see from an, um, an NHS perspective, is this a, a, a treatment that is worthwhile in the NHS investing in? The reason I, 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 I'm saying that is that if you think about it, if you have a, a lump in your thyroid that is, has been shown to be a benign lump, well, for most people, that lump does not need any treatment. Now, it might need treatment if, from a cosmetic point of view, you don't like the look of it, or if it's giving you symptoms. But the reality is most thyroid lumps don't cause symptoms. So therefore, for, for a benign lump, you might say, well, what, what's the place of RFA? You know, the, there's not, um, the, the, there's a, you know, most benign lumps actually don't need any treatment at all. On the other side of coin, if you've got a cancer, well, I would say if you've got a thyroid cancer, all the evidence is, is that you should have an operation to remove the lump. And, you know, there, there aren't large scale studies that show that RFA is um, beneficial in thyroid cancer. There are some centers that will use it if you've got a lymph node that's involved. Um, but again, these are, these are relatively small case series. So that's why I'm saying that at the moment, I think RFA is a therapy that is available in some centers, but I think it's looking for a place, I would say, because I think the evidence base for it is, is, not, is not absolutely robust. Um, thank you. That's useful to have that background. We've been asked by NICE to, 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 to contribute to, towards the, to the consultation. So if there's anybody listening today who has experience of um, radio frequency ablation, then please get in touch with us if you'd like to take part in the consultation and we can uh, let you know how to contribute to it. Um, this is an, an interesting one. Somebody saying that they've had two FNAs for uh, thyroid nodules. And a couple of weeks afterwards, it felt like they had a lump in their throat. Could, uh, can the FNAs um, be made worse by the nodules being, sorry, can the, uh, the nodules be made worse by being poked around? Yeah, oh, I, absolutely. So, it, well, it's not that the nodules made worse. It's just that the thyroid gland is a very, has got a very rich blood supply. And it's almost inevitable when you do an FNA that you will pierce tiny little blood vessels within the thyroid. You can't avoid doing that. And so in effect, you get, you get bleeding around the, around the nodule. And in some people, that bleeding is, 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 is more than, than, than in others. And actually in itself can cause, a, can cause a swelling. And it's just like a big bruise. With time, it will reabsorb and, and go away, but it is just like a big bruise in the, in the thyroid. Thank you. And another kind of a, a slight um, question to put, put in for the time being is about surgical, can the surgical use of iodine cause, go cause goiters? We get asked this question from time to time and we're never quite sure. No, you mean, um, you mean um, the uh, antiseptic uh, wipes that are, uh, you, you know, the, the, when you're when you're washed with iodine before an operation, I think that's what. what that yes, is. and also in scans, they can be um, yeah. an iodine scans as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that there, there's no evidence that that these um, that this causes uh, nodules or, or goiters. See, if anything, it's iodine deficiency that causes uh, that causes a, a, a goiter or or nodules, not excess iodine as such. If you had somebody um, who had Graves' disease, say, and had kind of borderline overactive uh, um, thyroid blood tests, if they took a lot of iodine, so say they uh, ate large amounts of seaweed, 
um, then that could make your thyroid hormone levels become more overactive um, in the uh, in in the short term. Uh, but but other than that, no. In terms of surgical iodine, it doesn't get absorbed in through the skin in any meaningful amounts. And in iodine contrast medium in, in X-rays, the amount of iodine is trivial that's in them, much, much less than is in normal diet. Oh, that's good to know that we remember that for future questions as well. Um, what is the follow-up for a U3 graded benign nodule? And is there anything out uh, to look out for in the kind of what, what kind of, yeah, what kind of follow-up yeah, should yeah. they expect? So, so a U3 nodule, often that nodule would be biopsied, wouldn't always be biopsied, but often it would be biopsied. Um, and if the biopsy suggests that the nodule is, is benign, then in some centers, they may say, okay, that's fine. You're discharged. You don't need any follow-up at all. In other centers, they would do a follow-up ultrasound scan after a, a variable interval in, uh, of time. But you have all those caveats that I said before about actually what's the purpose of that follow-up scan? If you're looking for growth, that may, may in itself not be a very reliable uh, marker. So um, U3 nodules are, I, I'd say, I think there's still an uncertainty about what the optimum follow-up, if any, there should be of uh, U3 nodules, which on biopsy have, uh, have been shown to be benign. And I think there is, um, you, again, you'll be able to, to um, it's, um, tell the, the, the viewers more than me that there is actually some work going on nationally looking at um, follow-up of thyroid nodules. There is, and that's, that's a, a new consensus statement, which um, hopefully will be produced later in the year. So hopefully will be more clarity for all of us. And, and certainly we're help, helping produce a patient leaflet to go with to accompany that. So we'll certainly share it as soon as it's, it's, it's ready. Um, what would you say is the best treatment for multinodular gorota? Would it be radioactive iodine or surgery? So it uh, depends on two things. Um, if you've got, um, if you have overactive, if, if it's a multinodular goiter and you have an overactive thyroid is causing overactivity, then you do need treatment. If it's a multinodular goiter with normal thyroid blood tests, then that, that need not need any treatment at all uh, is the first thing to say. If it's not causing you any uh, symptoms, and is not bothering you from a, a cosmetic point of view. If though, for whatever reason, you need uh, treatment, then it's like, whether you go for surgery or radioactive iodine, I think is a very personal decision. If you're having the operation for cosmetic reasons, then probably surgery is the, is the better option because radioactive iodine is not very good at shrinking a multinodular goiter, particularly where thyroid hormone levels are normal. It can cause a bit of shrinkage, but it's not going to shrink it away completely, whereas surgery will remove the goiter completely. If you've got um, an overactive uh, thyroid, then radioactive iodine is a really effective treatment for the overactivity, and it's got the simplicity of being a capsule that you, that you swallow. But there is the downside of the restrictions that are in place following the radioactive iodine treatment for um, four to six weeks um, after the therapy, depending on uh, the dose and depending on, on your local policies. And that then comes into your personal circumstances. If you um, are a parent of young children, then being isolated from your kids for or having restricted contact for, for several weeks after radioiodine is not going to be a great option for you. And surgery may be, uh, may be preferable. So it, it's very much a personal decision. The only thing I would say is if you're having it for cosmetic and actually for symptomatic reasons, surgery is probably better than uh, radioactive iodine if your blood tests are normal. And, and, and if you feel like you're being pushed toward in one direction uh, to have one treatment or the other, it's always... Um, is it always important to get, have a proper discussion with your healthcare professionals, isn't it, to find out if the other, uh, the other, there is another option for you. You shouldn't ever feel 
forced to have one without oh, yeah. the full facts in front of you. None of us should ever feel forced into having a treatment that we do not want to have. And yeah. certainly, as you rightly say, you know, it is important um, that you do explore with your healthcare professional. Are there any other options that are available to me? And you might say, what, what about radioactive iodine? Could I have that? And it may be that there are particular reasons why radioactive iodine is, is, is not an ideal option. You know, for example, if you saw me with a multinodular goiter um, and your blood tests were normal, I would say to you, well, look, I think surgery is going to be the better option for you here. I think the results are likely to be better than radioactive iodine. You can have radioactive iodine if you want, but I think surgery is going to be the better option. Yeah. And if there's anybody listening who'd like to find out more about thyroid surgery or uh, radioactive iodine as a treatment for an overactive thyroid, we've got two uh, earlier webinars that cover those topics. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll be able to find them as well. Um, somebody asking here um, about Graves. They've had Graves disease for 10 years on the medication. Thyroid became a little enlarged. Um, Carbimazole was in was dose was increased monitored every six weeks how long does it take for the goiter to reduce in size and they are having radioactive iodine in three months yeah so the goiter main in, in some people when you render them um euthyroid normal thyroid hormone levels the goiter will shrink back but in some people it doesn't radioactive iodine so i said that radioactive iodine wasn't very good at shrinking the goiter of a multinodular a goiter, it's actually pretty good at shrinking uh, a goiter in Graves' disease. So you may find that after radioactive iodine that the goiter does shrink back. Um, great. Uh, let me just see. Um, I've got a benign multinodular goiter. Should it be monitored to check out if it's getting worse or not? Uh, is it permanent? We covered well, follow up a little yeah, bit, but yeah. so I'd say, well, um, yeah, lumps in the thyroid are permanent. They rarely go away themselves. The exception to that is if you have a cyst in your thyroid, a fluid-filled bag, or a lump that is mixed solid and cystic. Sometimes the cyst element can actually burst for whatever reason, and um, the, the you know the fluid just leaks away and that can cause the lump to to shrink down but by and large if you have a multinodular goiter you will have a multinodular goiter um if you've had an ultrasound that says that the the goiter is uh, looks benign looks reassuring then you say for the reasons I articulated earlier you may not need any uh, further scans that may not be uh, necessary uh, but generally, we do recommend that every one to two years, you should have your thyroid blood test checked just to ensure that um, the thyroid hormone levels aren't uh, changing. And obviously, if you noticed any change in the look or feel of the of the goiter, then by all means, discuss that with your GP. But it need not. It's not an absolute that that needs follow up. Right. And what about an, another alternative uh, that we sometimes are asked about is ethanol ablation, which I know is available in some centres. What types of nodule would that be suitable for? So ethanol ablation, um, I, again, I, the, is what I said about RFA, radiofreak ablation, almost similarly applies to, um, uh, to ethanol ablation with two caveats. If you have a large cyst, then ethanol ablation can be quite effective for that. And usually what happens is that the cyst is drained of fluid under ultrasound guidance, and then ethanol is injected back into it at the, you know, immediately. And that can be effective in uh, causing the walls of the cyst to stick together and, um, uh, and stops the cyst from recurring. Ethanol ablation for solid nodules, mm, there's, again, there's not a huge amount of uh, good quality data out there uh, about it. There is some published information about ethanol ablation for people with um, recurrent thyroid cancer in the, in the neck, in lymph glands, again, injecting ethanol into the lymph gland with the cancer cells and um, um, uh, ablating that. But 
Again, the quality of those studies is, I would say, is, is variable. And I think most people would still say at the moment that the definitive treatment for people who have got recurrent thyroid cancer is an operation of one form or another. Um, this lady says her antithyroid medication co uh, caused her to have severe liver function, so she can't yeah. uh, take antithyroid drugs. Um, is there an alternative to them for her because she's now having to kind of live with symptoms of uh, Graves' disease without treatment other than... So, yeah, the, well, the, the options would be uh, surgery and radioactive iodine. If you can't have antithyroid medication, then we would generally advocate treatment with radioactive iodine or an operation. The slight problem with an operation is that you, ideally you want to have normal thyroid hormone levels going into the operation, but you can get, there are alternatives to antithyroid medication to get your thyroid hormone levels normal in the two to three weeks prior to surgery. Right. Um, um, so yeah, that should certainly be discussed with, a, with an endocrinologist. So in that case, it would be important to kind of talk about the next stage and how long she might have to put up with these probably very unpleasant symptoms as yeah, well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the genetic tests? I'm not sure what these are, but you may. What are your thoughts on the genetic tests offered by companies like Verisite? So these, I suspect, are, are well, there's, I'm, not into, I don't, I'm not familiar with Verisite uh, particular. There are two, I suspect, this is looking at uh, deiodinase, uh, what we call deiodinase polymorphisms, looking at how well you convert T4 to T3. I suspect that's what it is. Um, if that is uh, uh, what I think it is, then I, they, the evidence base, again, surrounding those is very poor. Um, and um, these are expensive tests and often do not lead to necessarily a change in treatment. Um, there is going to be another webinar, though, I think it's next week, is it, uh, Julia, on, uh, on T4 and T3, uh, which is primarily intended for healthcare professionals, but um, that may be the sort of thing that uh, I suspect that's the sort of thing that may be discussed at that webinar. I think any, anybody listening today who's interested in finding out more about T3 or lithyronine as a treatment for thyroid disorders, then uh, you'd be very welcome to come along to the, uh, to the debate we're having next week. In fact, Mark, Mark is going to be our chair next Tuesday. So go to the BTF website to find out about that and how to join it. There's a question here. Um, my daughter was diagnosed with an underactive thyroid and a goiter at age 10, but she's, uh, she's never had a goiter checked in seven years. And she's under the care of a GP, but she's not having a goiter check. Should it be checked again? And should, should this parent be pushing for that? No, not necessarily, no. Uh, it, um, goiter is very common in people with an underactive thyroid. And... Um, Sometimes it goes away with levothyroxine treatment, but sometimes it doesn't. Providing the goiter has not changed in size, you know, it's not progressively getting bigger, I would not say that that uh, specifically needs to be seen. It, in, in a sense, it's the same as somebody with Graves' disease presenting with a, with a goiter. Most of the time, we wouldn't do a scan of somebody with um, a Graves' disease and a goiter because we know what the diagnosis is. And in, in, and in this, uh, the, the, the daughter of this, uh, this person's case, you, we, we know what the diagnosis is. It's hypothyroidism, presumably autoimmune hypothyroidism. And you know, that is a sufficient explanation for the goiter. Thank you. I will, I will, it's quarter past seven then, Mark. Are you happy to have a, a few more questions? Yes. That's all yeah, right. Course, Thank you, because we've got, we, we might not be able to get through them all, but any we don't get through, we will um, get Mark, ask Mark to, to answer them for you and we'll publish on the website so nobody should lose out. Um, there we are. Um, I'm, somebody's asking about, are they having their goiter removed in three weeks surgically and they're wondering what the average recovery time is 
from a, a thyroid surgery operation? Uh, if, if you're a fit and well individual, then the recovery time is pretty quick. Uh, most people within a couple of weeks of surgery will be back to the normal selves. Okay, for more information about that, if you if you go to the BTF website, it's, it's a fair bit of information you'll find. Um, my, somebody saying my nodule is more noticeable in the last few weeks and I feel a bit off. Does it mean that he's grown again? Well, I... It could mean that, but more often than not, it doesn't. Thyroid nodules um, grow very, very slowly. You, you're, you're usually talking millimeters of growth over, um, over a year or two years. Um, so if you've had an evaluation of the thyroid nodule, there was, it looked very reassuring on the scan, then you know, it's very unlikely that that would suddenly grow very big. And I say, I, it's a bit like when people say that they feel that the nodule sometimes is bigger and sometimes smaller. I don't have a, a great explanation for that, but I, again, sometimes people do feel that, you know, for some reason, there's just a the nodule's got a bit bigger and actually you do a scan and it's, it's not, it's not changed. But if in any doubt as ever, you should, you should speak to your, your GP about that. Right. And I think there's just, there's one more I'll ask, which is a kind of a general pandemic type question which is quite interesting to know about in your experience are there any particular issues you're you're seeing uh with th thyroid patients but partic particularly with um nodules uh that that are uh, uh, people you worried about patients being missed as a result of patients not being able to get access to healthcare professionals yeah well so i um the ev so the first thing to say is that i don't think there's any particularly strong evidence that COVID particularly affects the thyroid. There are some anecdotal reports, but um, there's no particularly strong evidence um, of that. But the issue around delayed diagnosis is as true of thyroid as it is of many, many, many other healthcare problems. We know that, that you know, there, ha there is now delayed diagnosis ac across a whole slew of healthcare problems. I suppose the um, with with regards thyroid lumps. Thankfully, because most lumps grow very very slowly, the fact that diagnosis has been delayed by some months usually does not make much difference. Even if the lump turns out to be a thyroid cancer, it usually does not make any difference. Uh, a delay of uh, of a few months, but. Um, you know, if people are concerned that they have a lump in their in their thyroid, then they should be uh, pushing to get uh, a, an assessment by a, a, a primary care clinician. So either go back through your GP or if you're waiting for a follow up appointment, kind of co contact with the, the yeah. hospital department and let them know you're there and waiting and hopefully you can move up the list somehow. Right. I, th I think that's all the time we've got for questions now, but we will do any others that haven't been picked up, we'll, we will deal and publish. Uh, but if, if there's something you, um, you'd like in the meantime, anybody can contact the BTF through a normal medical query service. Um, I will bring my, thank you very much, Mark. If I bring that again, hopefully you can see my slide again. Um, that works. Um, it was we, we've all learned a lot today um, certainly us at the BTF have been listening um, my, my colleagues and I'm sure all the patients who've um, been been listening in on behalf of themselves or, or family members um, anybody who joined the webinar late or didn't have time to write stuff down with the, there will, will be a recording that will go on our we added to our website and our YouTube channel so you can watch it again and um, get everything down. We'll also do a transcript script to the questions in due course when we have a chance to do that. And so you can read all the questions and share them with other people you might know, think who might find it useful. Um, as I mentioned, any questions you've got, please, please send them in to our medical queries helpline. Um, but we will also aim to answer the questions that we haven't answered um, on the, from the Q&A tonight. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, I'd like to find out more about thyroid disorders generally, but also specifically about 
nodules and surgery and radioactive iodine. There's a lot of information on our website. We've got patient leaflets in several languages. We've got videos, patient stories, um, films about all aspects of thyroid disease. Um, and you can also go to previous recordings um, of we webinars, in particular about thyroid uh, surgery and uh, radioactive iodine, which will be relevant for many people listening today. Um, our website has also got details of our support network, so the Facebook groups, which we've got, we have a Facebook group for people with an overactive thyroid and thyroid cancer and parents of children with thyroid disorders as well. And we know that many patients uh, and families find these really valuable as a source of support to, to get to hear from other patients. If you've got any feedback from tonight's uh, meeting, we would love to hear from you. Um, we'll send out a short feedback form after the event, but uh, you can contact us in any way to tell us how you found the event and also to, um, to give us some ideas about uh, for future meetings, what future topics. We're hoping to do uh, a meeting about thyroid function tests, which I think would be useful to virtually everybody. So keep an eye on our website uh, and we'll, we'll let you know about that when it's been organised. Um, there is a meeting about a, a debate about T3 and T4 next week. So if you'd like to come and listen to that, it's on Tuesday night. Details are on our website or we'll, we will share details about how to how you can join that. And Mark will be the will be chairing that debate. And finally, if you've enjoyed tonight's webinar, which I hope you have, I'm sure you have, please do consider making a donation to the BTF or becoming a member, which will support the work we do. Like many other charities in the UK and around the world, our fundraising income has declined dramatically due, due to COVID. And we'd appreciate any support. It's just £27 a year for a full member or £17 for concessions, um, the unwaged, to become a BTF member. And there are lots of men, ben, member benefits, including receiving a 16-page new, newsletter three times a year and regular e-bulletins in between times. And you'll also be helping to fund uh, essential research into thyroid disorders, which will help patients in the future. So if you're able to donate, you can follow the links to donate or to become a member from our website. So once again, thank you very much to Mark for giving up your time tonight. Um, we really value everything you've told us and the, the, the time you've given us. And a huge thank you as well to everybody who's joined the webinar and all the, the fantastic questions you've asked. Please stay in touch. Um, we look forward to your taking part in our future events. Thank you.